Hello, good afternoon. I would like to thank on behalf of AFIA for the invitation to be here in this week. It will be great to talk to Marty and Filippi, two entrepreneurs who I personally admire and I always learn when I talk to them. The first a point and I'm going to start with questions here. The first question is, and we have a very interesting dynamic here with uh, two people with different backgrounds and experience. And this is a very constant discussion in our industry. Entrepreneurs, uh, do they necessarily have to be young or can we be successful entrepreneurs at any point in our careers? So please give us a very brief a report of your background, your training, and what were you doing before creating our Expra? Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. I am a business administrator by training. When when we analyze entrepreneurs, they tend to be people who are curious and cannot settle down. And it can be at any point in your life and anywhere. The first time I uh, became an entrepreneur, it was at a corporate level. I was the CEO of a dermatology lab at the time of dot com. And I thought that the portals and the future of communication, it was between uh, the industry and physicians. And we created DermaWeb, which brought together the industry and physicians, which was an attempt of having fewer intermediates and bringing together these two dimensions in a much closer fashion. I worked for 30 years in uh, the pharmaceutical industry, 15 of them as a CEO. And what we tried to solve at that time was not solved. So when I left the corporate world, I said, well, let me try to solve what I didn't manage to do with a number of dot-com companies. Some of them um, failed. Digital initiatives have learned a lot from what we used to have and the journey of dot com companies. And that's how our Expra started. We can talk more about it later, but the dimension of people and entrepreneurs, that's how I would like to start. What about you, Filippi? Please tell us, because at AFIA, we have physicians and non-physicians uh, as entrepreneurs in medical area. So please tell us, what is your background and how did you get involved with medicine? Hello, everyone. It's great to be here talking to you. I'm Filippi. I'm 34. I've been an entrepreneur in health for over eight years. I'm not a physician. I have a training in medical informatics at the University of Sao Paulo. It's a computer engineering course focused on medical issues or health issues. So it's multidisciplinary training. I understand a little bit about health and technology, trying to solve the problems that this area have. But it doesn't mean that uh, there is no need to keep on reinventing ourselves. This is absolutely necessary. Now, telling a little bit about my journey, this is the third time I uh, am an entrepreneur. The one is I game was in healthcare. One of them didn't work out fine. The other two times I had the like, and privilege to build two nice businesses which uh, were maintained long lasting and it's a great experience, very valuable. 
and now being with with an eye clinic which brings together my training and adds value on it is a constant driver you say we are we have so many interesting topics to discuss and it will be great to chat with you and tell you how to be an entrepreneur in health and talk about health tax great i normally say that the failures are sometimes can be a, a successful failure. We've just heard two examples. We have all been through a bumper in our lives and let us revisit a pain that I had identified with a new technology or a new approach. Now, speaking of uh, that restlessness, which entrepreneurs tend to have, this energy, this interest, curiosity. In the first half of the year, there were 200 million invested in Health Act. I had a previous experience with AFIA and there was a similar growth at the same pace. So then I ask you, you asked me where you came from, an administrator, someone who studied information technology, What were the pain points that made you develop eye clinic and first you, Filippi, and then Martin? Eye clinic started in 2012. I had started analyzing it before while I was at my uh, under graduation and the possibility of creating eye clinic resulted from my observation of to what extent physicians were simply put aside by the information technology market they were eager to uh, have good solutions brought to them but there were none at that time all health technology players in Brazil and from abroad were more focused on creating solutions for enterprise, for large companies, for large hospital groups, for clinical labs or HMOs. And I've realized that physicians individually were not very digitalized. something that we value at AFIA now, we think physicians are one of the main agents of, of transformation in healthcare. So we were created with the purpose of helping this professional. We started with electronic medical record solution, which is the one most used by physicians where they can document uh, the visit notes, prescriptions, telemedicine. We have the first solution, which is software as a service. It was a plugin. And uh, once we understood their pains, we expanded the platform. So it's not only a medical record, but a complete management tool, digitalizing all process within the office. That's how iClinic started. We scaled up the company for the past eight years from three managers to over 250 staff members. We are market leaders in the segment and we serve physicians in their clinics and offices in all states of Brazil and over 50 specialties. And we got to a certain point and was acquired by AFIA in October last year. And we have maintained our mission but now we have an expanded scope. First, we wanted to help physicians in their offices, and now we want to help them throughout their whole career with more technology, nice services, and products of quality. That's great. 
What about you, Marty? I think that's to some extent you've already said as you identified some potential problems, but health acts are somewhat uh, new in Brazil, but it's good to know and to speak about those that uh, what has happened uh, to serve as input for future health tax. So please tell us uh, what have you identified to create Rx Pro. So carry on from what I stopped in my first comment. For these 15 years as a CEO of a pharma company having to decide about budget, for example, the industry invests 20 to 30% of what of, of sales in I call go to doctor or go to market if you want, which is to interact with physicians a very significant amount, even more than what's spent in R&D into new products. So that has always it has always made me feel that we could use the money more wisely. At the same time, even though we invest, or the pharma industry invested a lot, and I'm going to rely on Brazilian data. In Brazil, there are 500,000 physicians, and the industry can interact with 100, 150,000 physicians. Some can reach 200,000. More than half of the physicians are not exposed to continuing product education. And it's an important thing. But uh, why not? Well, because the model that we use is a very expensive model. Therefore, and that's, that was my attempt at dot-com era, coming up with a way to make a, a more updated, inclusive model and a more economical model. That was something that I experienced on the side of the equation. At the same time, I've always been an executive going to uh, medical uh, congresses. I think it's important to interact, to see what uh, presentations are being made, to hear about uh, innovations and so on. And now we go to the physician side. There is an incredible number of uh, updates of information that have to be learned by physicians to make good prescriptions. So ultimately, the industry and the medical community, uh, they are treating uh, symptoms, well-being. The patient is ultimately important. And this is why so much is invested to effectively prescribe well. And that's where Rx Pro, Rx, it means prescription in English, and Pro because they are professionals dedicated to doing it. The most important pain is how can we help doctors be constantly updated to prescribe the most modern agents, the most appropriate agent to that specific patient. So these were two points. And there is a tail, tailwind there that carries it around, which is the provision of technology. And Philippe is one of this eye clinic has transformed the dynamic of the physician's office, increased productivity, has created more transparent process, better track down, telemedicine, um, electronic prescription, digitalization of contents, online items, etc. 
it has transformed how the patient gets to the office. The patient has been through Dr. Google before. So it's the second doctor that the person is going to come to talk about. So that's a huge challenge to physicians. And one of our missions is to help physicians make better prescriptions and have more time to patients. Great. I think you both pointed out very interesting things to help us navigating to the next question. So first, the physician as a gatekeeper of health in Brazil. And since I joined AFIA, I'm sure I had that idea before, but it got consolidated that uh, being a doctor requires a, a vocation. It's something constantly, nonstop. And Martin, you pointed out some important things. A physician is the agent of this area. At AFIA, we have a long ecosystem that covers the whole physician's journey. But the problem is more of a demographics, more than number of physicians. And it's a career full of challenges. There are major milestones, so uh, residency or having night shifts. And physicians have a very long journey. That all that, a physician as an agent and a physician that has to be an entrepreneur. Philippe, tell us more about this component because you interact with a number of service as part of AFIA ecosystem, but tell us more about this entrepreneur physician and how much it is in, included, understood, and how we can see that. Not for physicians to become entrepreneurs, but for physicians to do what they want, which is to really uh, have time and provide care because that's what they want to do. Such a nice question because this is something um, that we have always thought about. We have believed in it since the time we created the business and we've been focusing on trying to show physicians, especially those physicians who graduate and decide that they are going to provide care in their offices, we know sometimes they work in different hospitals and sometimes they also are uh, professors. But once they decide to have their private practice, it is a business after all to make money. The most important part, which is practicing medicine and it has a purpose, but at the same time, you have to pay the receptionist, you have to pay rent and power, and it's your profession. It's how you make uh, ends meet. Graduating in medicine still does not teach, does not offer that kind of knowledge to physicians. We know the medical curriculum is very dense and it focuses on what matters the most and what physicians by vocation love to do. But the market has gained and has become much more professional. Patients have different profile. They are empowered by technology. They make questions. They demand services of quality. So it's increasingly more important for physicians to understand about business, about management. And the key word is 
they perceive themselves not only as physicians, but as entrepreneurs as well. So we've been addressing it, bringing contents and showing to physicians how they can bring best practices and management practices to their daily practice. Because in the end of the day, the main purpose is once seen as entrepreneurs and bringing this uh, best practices and working in quality and optimizing time, this is ultimately is going to make physicians have more time to do what they like doing. Seeing patients, seeing patients with uh, more attention, they won't be concerned that within uh, two weeks they'll have to pay for an equipment, that uh, a piece of equipment, and that will provide them a, a time to dedicate. It's also important to have a good balance between professional and personal life, but that will mean more time uh, with the family, more quality of life. I think that now that we have younger physicians coming into the market, they want to know about entrepreneurship, uh, medical finance, medical marketing, and so on and so forth. It's a career that really requires a lot of investment. So recovery that more efficiently. So someone who keeps on investing continuously. So continuing education, uh, getting prepared and how that can be really, how they can be properly trained especially now that patients kind of self-diagnosis. Now, in terms of uh, uh, business, you came with that, you identified that being in the industry and this correlation between physician and pharma company really focus on education, get instruments. Is it something that already existed? Do you think about this business as integrating more the existing channels such as sales reps and others? Tell us more. I think it was Tuesday or Thursday, I don't know. Julio, who is our VP of digital services, and he is much better in teaching than I am. I've learned a lot from him. And he said that what we have to keep on doing is to provide technology-mediated education. It is a journey that physicians are going to maintain for life. The professional life of physicians, they can. It's a very long lesson. There are great physicians who work up to the age of 60s, 70s. But what have they got differently from the others? They had the opportunity to get updated to really master the most advanced technology, which also involves access. So taking part in international congresses, developing as a speaker, Technology integrates more, answering your question. I don't think there's going, there are going to be fewer intermediates, maybe a little bit when we think about communication, but I still think we can have multi-channel applications. I believe there are some things that human beings and RAPs, MSLs, They are people who are trained in medicine, who communicate to their fellow physicians about new drugs, about innovations of the pharmaceutical industry.
So this discussion among two people who know profoundly the topic or reps who have met these physicians for many years and attract their attentions with uh, attractive message will keep on existing. However, however every year there are, uh, what, 20, 30 new uh, active ingredients. So 10, 110,000. So 10, 30 that we see, FDA, for example, um, approve new chemical entities, brand new things. These innovations are transformed into brands. So the 10 will become 100 or 200. At the same time, these brands may have different dosings, different package insert indication so that gets to the 1000 so updates which ultimately qualifies and uh, sets apart physicians so we we leave the world of dr google so the product before being launched it's already being addressed in different levels of the web. This is a very important point of the pharmaceutical industry. Get the multi-channel characteristic. So there is room for having professionals, but in Brazil, there are 33 million medical visits per year, visits to physicians. We have this culture of sampling, of offering free sample. The patient starts taking a free sample and get the product that's going to be purchased. The sink, second, uh, this part of multi-channel structure, which is really important, which is the person uh, trying and using a product effectively, and also the digital nature of it. Most of the update needs a contact that takes the physician from a regular uh, routine. And this is the mantra of our expo. We would love, and this is our mission really, making medical advertising, but wherever the physician is willing to get it. And Felipe knows that probably better than anyone, physicians just are present in different localities, different places. So why don't we allow them to tell us how to consume content? Because ultimately we are all consumers, right? We consume information differently from what it used to be five, 10 or 20 years ago. So we decide when that's going to happen. And the dynamic of the industry and the rap uh, has also to follow the same lines. Wonderful, Martin. So it really takes me to something that we mentioned a lot in marketing when we are talking about experience, which is something that we all try to deliver. So it's really great to talk about the right person at the right time and the right message. So it takes me to my next question. And it's good if we have anyone hearing us about that. We've talked about message, our, or even how the products such as the portal of content per, very mad. So 
how can we, what kind of framework can we consider for new functionalities or a new acquisition? There were some questions about acquisition per se, but to think about uh, framework when we are considering an ecosystem, what are we taking into account? But thinking about the product or services we are delivering, what new functionalities can we use in our products? Well, in the end of the day, I think I can answer your two questions with one single uh, answer. When we think about the development of new functionalities or what makes a solution be an m a target, it all depends on building products that physicians love. This is what we want to do. So let's try to recap what Evia, Evia thinks. What we want is to be the main partner of physicians from day one in class up to the last day of career and help them not only in terms of education, which is something that Afia has always done, but with digital products, really helping them in specific strategies and specific pain Today, when we look to a doctor on the fifth or sixth year of med school, there are problems and pain points that expect to be solved. So a physician who is in the residency program has other difficulties and uh, someone in the office has a different pain point. The most important thing in the platforms, we have to think the ones we have at home and others that we can bring. And those who are hearing us, you have to look to your end user, who is the physician. We know that there are different stakeholders. Maybe there are some who have problems involving HMOs or the pharma industry. So I think the process of empathy is really important. And it shouldn't be limited only to paper. All businesses that you can see, it says focus on clients. It's easy to say that, but it's easier said than done, right? So I think that we should have the guide and the principle uh, of all decisions of the organization. So maybe if you don't know what to do, start thinking from the customer's perspective. For our user, what is the best option? And it's a very important process. It is going from the office and going to the field and uh, listen to them. And based on that, really show the customer and deliver the customer solutions that are going to solve their issues. This is what we've been doing in all our businesses. The roadmap of a digital company is never ending. We are always trying to improve the experience of users. And we are confident that if we do that, we are going to create the largest ecosystem of physicians in the country. If we are going to generate value to the pharmaceutical industry, to the hospital, so bringing together the segment of health and physician, so it's all focused on users, So product development, as we call it. Great, today in the morning, in a different context, we were speaking about the experience and how that's going to make a difference. And I, we were saying, how can we be sure 
that what we've brought to the market is successful or not. And uh, we could measure that by maybe uh, taking it from the market and see how that would impact. Those who have eye clinic, they wouldn't make do without it today. They would really uh, feel pain. Philippi participates very actively at AFIA in assessing the ecosystem, what else to be integrated. And he has talked about our framework for internal development of a new functionality. And I'd like to hear the other side. It's good to see things from the outside with fresh eyes. Now we've talked about our decisions of acquisition. And my question to you is, what about for those who have just joined the market? How have you thought about the decision of uh, uh, join a new group? What did you take into consideration when you also joined AFIA? It's good to talk about this possibility of entrepreneurs not only being part of an ecosystem. I'm glad you decided to join us, but uh, tell us what you took into consideration and what you recommend that they do. You're, you are on mute. When you create a startup. I thought about a 10 year scenario. What do I want within the next 10 years? Because I know it's a huge challenge. What we have to be digitalized, enhanced, and shared is huge. 33 million visits, 500,000 physicians. 1 billion free samples distributed every year. The 10, 100, 1,000 challenge. Things that ultimately happen at the physician's office. Whenever I talked to investors, strategic investors, the question was always that, shall I do it myself with my partners? Or are they going to uh, complete this mission? For me, I wouldn't deliver my 10 year plan for anyone because it, it becomes like a baby, right? We need clarity to really deliver something ready. And also, understand what are the resources and skills needed for it. And we have to be uh, mindful of it all. Entrepreneurs are restless, but they have to have good common sense. Within AFIA ecosystem, I've realized I could not only deliver what I had promised that uh, our expro, but do even more. And this is what has brought me here. One of our digital initiative, which is PubMed, white book from Bruno Lagureiro, is perfectly aligned with what we do. We can deliver that uh, inclusion to young physicians so all these things made my eyes really shine. Great, it's so good that we can share uh, these babies and dreams.
I still have one important question to ask you. Well, there was the pandemic and we saw a, a speed up in the use of technology between patients and physicians that it would take more than two decades. I incorporate that myself. Now I have teleconsultation and I have no time to, uh, you know, go to the doctor's office, park my car and all that. So with digital prescription, it's great. 40 minutes, it's all done. So we've seen a great uh, success. So let's talk about the future. I know it's not fair, but let's do it anyway. Felipe, what new technology would you believe if you could choose, if you could select? So even existing app, uh, an, an existing technology such as uh, telemedicine, right? That uh, we've been using a lot or anything else? Anything that you would bet your chips on? Chips on. Well, so many options when we can talk about the future. There are just so many possibilities. Uh, let me tell you about something that I really like and believe there is a lot of potential. There are some uh, uh, initiatives starting, but personalized medicine based on genetic data. Now we have the biotechnology market with great breakthroughs. I really believe that we can bring together medical knowledge that we already have uh, and what uh, professionals already have in their minds. So combining that with genetic information from the individuals generated through test results. Once you combine that between selecting one medication or another one, a diet or the other, you can recommend something that's going to work for that specific subject. And depending on my genotype, it may be different from yours and it will be different from someone else. And by doing that, we can be more precise, effective with fewer diverse events, and we can deliver better results. Once we bring together genetic therapy and just take it to the practice level. So the medical record will check the history with the genetic data of the patient and that will be translated into a suggestion which is more personalized. I really believe in it. Of course, we have a, a long journey till there. We've just begun, but that's at least how it starts. I could go on and on um, here with you, and I apologize, Martin. I just uh, extrapolated the time. Mauro had asked a very interesting question, which is the estimated cost of health, especially with us for the universal healthcare system. So Mauro, please contact us at LinkedIn. It's a, a living question at AFIA. And I'll be able to keep on talking to Felipe and Martin here at AFIA, but please uh, reach us at LinkedIn. This is a conversation that we are highly interested in. I apologize that I got taken away and uh, could go on and on uh, talking, but before that, please just draw your closing remarks. Thank you all very much. Thank you for being with us. Our doors are open to interact with you. Please send your questions. And if you want to be a health entrepreneur, this is a window of opportunity. Health tags are really here to stay. We have just so many problems to address. And with good minds and technology, we can really cause the transformations most needed. Thank you. Great to be here. Gabriela, Filippi, and everyone who have stayed with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
it is a topic that we could uh, stay on and on. But I would like to answer your last question. Of course, we can talk it further. I strongly believe in telemedicine in a country as so big as Brazil with so many issues of inclusion technology can help us really go beyond. And this is really wonderful to bring together physicians and patients and to deliver health and innovation to people wherever they are in Brazil. I really believe in this technology. But that's it. Thanks, everyone. And as Felipe said, health tax have a lot to do, and hopefully we can have more and more possibilities to reinforce our ecosystem. Thank you.